Welcome back everybody. So now we're just going to finish up problem 9 to B in problem 9 1 C. Well, that's where we went through the first part of this test, looking at the sales incentive to increase sales at a car dealership. My most recent video, part F, we calculated some probabilities of committing a type 2 error so that we have an understanding of how our exposure to a type 2 error is reliant on the proximity or the distance between the actual value that, I, that satisfies the alternative and our hypothesized value. So that gives us some idea about probability of committing a type 2 and we talked about the power of the test. Now we're going to go through how do I control our exposure to a type 2 error. So again, let's just clean up some space here. This is the second time that I've gone through this. My earlier video, 9.1, 9.2a, uh, went through this in maybe a little bit more detail. But nonetheless, let's just make sure we understand what we're doing. To control our exposure to a type 2, again, we never know what the actual population mean is. But we can specify some degree of tolerance, some degree of a magnitude of that error. And so that's what this statement is telling us. The manager is willing to risk a 10% probability of accepting the null hypotheses, in other words, believing that the incentive program was ineffective even if the actual number of cars sold increased to 99. So if the extent of the difference, if that incentive program, if it, wasn't, if it was effective, but it increased car sales by just three, so it increased it from 96 to three, I'm willing to accept, or the manager is willing to accept a 10% chance of not recognizing that small increase, small, three cars, okay? So this is how the question must be framed. I'm giving a magnitude of a tolerance, right? If, it's, if the alternative is, tr is true by a magnitude of three, right? I'm saying three because 99 is only three bigger than 96. If it's, if it's true by a magnitude of three, I'm comfortable with a 10% chance of just not even recognizing, not even recognizing that impact, okay? So again, how do we go about doing this? Well, as you may recall, let's clean up some space here. When we calculated these probabilities, these type two errors, remember we had those two distributions where here this was when we assume HO is true, and I'm not putting numbers in yet, we'll just put in a placeholder here for now. But then there's the situation where the alternative is true. And so if the alternative is true in this case, this is an upper tail test. So if the alternative is true, that means that it's somewhere up here. And this is true with some alternative value. So this is HA is true. Well, when we're performing these tests, remember, we're drawing a sample. We have a sample mean. I know I'm talking monotonously because, oh my goodness, it's not really that exciting, right? You've gone through it a few times and it's not the most exciting thing that you've done and you calculate that standard error or that, that test score and you compare it here to the standard normal distribution. Here's a Z and you compare it to Z alpha, right? That, that um, critical value and that defines that rejection space. In the previous video, we saw that when we're calculating type two errors, we're starting with this and we're figuring out what is that x bar star 
that defines that sample mean that defines our reject and our accept space. And that x bar star, well, it exists in both of those distributions. And then it's based on that, right, where this area here is alpha, and this area here was beta, right? That area represented the probability that if this is what the distribution looks like, that beta tells me the probability of drawing a sample from this distribution that is going to fall into this, my acceptance space. When here I can see the way I've drawn it, the alternative is true, right? Because we're increasing in this direction. So here I can see that as drawn, the alternative is true. So what's the probability that I draw a sample from this distribution when the alternative is true that is actually going to lead me to accept the false null? So for this exercise, what I can see is that this value is exactly the same in both of those distributions. So if I look where HO is true, well, I can see that X bar star, that's equal to the hypothesized value plus some critical value and that standard error, right? That would describe this space here. In this distribution, that x bar star can be described as mu a minus z beta, because this is some area beta in that lower tail, times sigma root n. Well, if these are both equal to x bar star, then I can set these equal to each other. And now I have some control because I know what my hypothesized value is. I can declare my level of comfort to a type 1 error. I know what the population standard deviation is. And that's the same, of course, over here. Now, what I can decide on, what is the magnitude of that error, right? So here, in my example, that's the 96. And in our exercise, the magnitude of that error that I'm willing to accept is if the actual population mean is 99. If it's 99, so the alternative is true, I'm willing to accept that 10% chance of committing a type 2 error. So then this is that 99. Well, here's beta. Here's the probability of a type 2 error. So that's that 0.1, right? And here alpha was 0.05. What's left? I solve for the sample size that meets these requirements. These requirements, these preferences, whatever you want to call them. So if I rearrange this, I get Z alpha, Z beta, squared, sigma squared, and this is going to be mu zero, mu a, squared. I'm not going to go through a derivation of this any more than it is just a little bit of an algebraic manipulation of that equality, okay? So, I'm going a little bit quickly because you might have noticed the message came up saying the battery in my pen is almost dead. Plus, we've already gone through this exercise in the previous video, so hopefully everybody's doing okay. So here is Z alpha, alpha was 0 0.05, so I know that's gonna be 1.645. We've seen that number come up a few times. Beta is 0.1. So that was this 10% chance. Well, what is that going to be? I don't know off the top of my head. Let's go to our Z tables. And now I'm looking for 0.1. Well, here, we're actually very close to it. 
with that previous uh, result, the closest I can see to point 0.1 is right over here. So that's going to be 1.2 coming up here, 8. So that gives me a value here of 1.28 squared. Our variance from this exercise, well, our standard deviation we found was 7, and of course our variance is given to us in the problem. So here's 49, and this difference is 99 minus 96. Okay, and then it's just a matter of punching numbers into our calculator. So here I'm going to have 1.645 plus 128 squared times 49 divided by, that's going to be 9. That gives me a value of 46 and a half. Again, we can't have fractions in our sample size, so we just round that up to 47. So if I use a sample size of 47, that meets all of the parameters of my test. I can perform the test at that 5% level of significance, and I know that if the actual population mean is upwards of 99, I'm risking just a 10% chance of incorrectly accepting. So there's a 10% chance that I will believe that the new sales program did not work when in fact it actually did. But maybe only up to an increase from 96 to 99 cars. Okay, so that's it. That's our second problem now, looking at a uh, type 2 error probabilities and power for a one-tail test. The next problem we'll look at is going to be all of the same stuff, a little bit different because we'll do a two-tail test. Okay, thanks for watching, everybody.